Uh, I do want to commend Sam for running this series because Revelation has so many important messages of encouragement for us as we face into challenging times. And Sam has asked me to complete the series by speaking on the theme of hope in Revelation. So I want to fire out a quick question to you, and I'd love you to shout back some possible answers that you may have, because you've now been having six weeks on this series. So I'm reckoning that you know the book really well (laughs) by now. So... Uh, With regard to this theme, here's my question. How many times does the word hope occur in the book of Revelation? Who would like to give me some suggested answers? 20? 14? 14? That's a good Revelation number. Any other? 55? Okay. 1,000? That's that's another good (laughs) Revelation number. We might come back to that in in a minute. The answer is zero. (laughs) Surprisingly, zero times. So it's like, huh? (laughs) It's like, what's going on? I've been asked to talk on hope in Revelation. But the word doesn't actually occur in the book. However, panic not, everybody. Worry not about this. Uh, The Greek word that is used for hope in the New Testament is elpis. It it occurs in 15 of the 27 New Testament books, but Revelation is not one of them. But don't worry, let's listen uh, on the next slide to something that the famous writer C.S. Lewis said. This is what Lewis wrote about how to write descriptions of things in a compelling way. He said this, In writing, don't use adjectives which merely tell us how you want us to feel about the things you are describing. I mean, instead of telling us the thing is terrifying, describe it so that we'll be terrified. Don't say it was delightful, Make us say delightful when we've read the description. You see, all those words, horrifying, wonderful, hideous, exquisite, are only like saying to your readers, please will you do my job for me. (laughs) Lewis was such a literary genius, but can you see what he's saying here? He's saying it's far more compelling to evoke a feeling of delight in someone if you describe it without using the word delight, but do it in a way that evokes delight. Let the power of the writing lead the reader to come to their own conclusion that it's delightful. Then the truth has really touched their heart. And that is what is going on with the book of Revelation. As you've seen, the writer who calls himself John, uses compelling and dramatic imagery in order to evoke hope. He doesn't use the word hope itself. He doesn't actually need to, because God is going to speak through the power of his writing to engender transforming hope in the depth of our hearts. So how does the book of Revelation do this? How does it evoke a powerful and transforming sense of hope in us? Well, what Revelation does is to chart an incredible trajectory of hope, which builds and builds across its pages until it reaches a mighty crescendo in the final few chapters. And in those closing pages, we are presented with a series of visions which convey the final victory of God. And that presentation of the final victory of God is crucial for us to live with a sense of hope in the here and now. Our present circumstances can be so challenging and difficult that all of us need to know that the tough stuff we experience now is not the final word 
on our lives. We need to know there is some kind of commensurate recompense for all our sufferings in the present. We long to know that for each time we have been treated badly, there will be a restoration of justice. We yearn for assurance that for each moment we have wrestled with physical infirmity, there will be a recompense of healing. We want the confidence of knowing that for every sorrow there will be joy. We ache for security and peace when we have known chaos and an unsettled existence. And we want to know that death does not signal the end, but is rather a stepping stone on our way to a glorious future. Are these not some of our deepest longings? And the book of Revelation offers us hope for every one of these deep longings. So the visions of the final victory of God are essential ingredients for our hope to patiently persevere in the midst of present challenges. And we're going to look in some detail at those visions in a moment. But the writer of Revelation, who's called John, feeds us tempting foretastes of the great conclusion to the book even before we get there. And there's not time this morning to give you every example of this from the book, but let me just whet your appetite with two very early examples from the book of Revelation. Right at the very beginning of the book, when the writer is describing his circumstances, he says this in Revelation 1, verse 9. Uh, you would have heard this in the very first message on the series, which Sam preached. He says, I, John, your brother and companion in the suffering and kingdom and patient endurance that are ours in Jesus. John wastes no time in this amazing book to tell us that he locates himself in two spaces. He is in the kingdom and he's in suffering. They are two overlapping dimensions of his life. He's suffering, he's in some kind of exile on the island of Patmos because of his faith. Life is not easy for him. But his experience of suffering has not removed him from the dimension of the kingdom of God. John knows that the kingdom broke into the world in a new way in Jesus. Jesus declared that the kingdom was at hand in and through his life. Whatever Jesus did and said shows us what the world looks like when God is truly in charge. Our experience of the kingdom is not yet complete, but in the present, we experience a foretaste of what the final victory of God will be like. The second example is in the letters to the seven churches, which Sam preached on in the second message of your series. At the end of each of the messages to the churches, the risen Jesus gives a promise to his people. They are promises that will apply if his people remain faithful to him in the midst of their challenges. And each promise links with the promises of God's victory and those visions later on. And on the screen, you can see how they link together. Each time the risen Jesus speaks into the present challenging contexts of his people, he's pointing their vision forwards to the new creation of the future. This is the anatomy of hope. Hope is always a looking beyond present circumstance to something better. And the Apostle Paul captures this so well in his letter to the Romans in chapter 8. He writes this, I consider that our present sufferings are not worth comparing with the glory that will be revealed in us. For the creation waits in eager expectation for the children of God to be revealed. Now, when he says that the creation is 
waiting expectantly. This is a rather tame English rendering of a very powerful and unusual Greek word, the word apokaradokia. It evokes the image of someone standing on tiptoe, straining their neck to see something good coming over the horizon. This is why J.B. Phillips, who was the first scholar to paraphrase the Bible, translates this verse in the following way uh, on the next slide. Uh, We should have this one. He says, the whole creation is on tiptoe to see the wonderful sight of the sons of God coming into their own. On tiptoe. That is our posture of hope. God's people are a people on tiptoe, on edge in a good way, as we anticipate the glorious coming of the victory of God. Now, there are other examples in the earlier chapters of Revelation of how it anticipates the visions of God's victory, but let's move on now to look at these visions in a bit more detail. How does the book of Revelation evoke hope through conveying the final victory of God? Well, it does it through what scholars call a series of seven unnumbered visions at the end of the book. In Revelation, some of the series of visions are numbered. So there are visions of seven seals, seven trumpets, and seven bowls. And each of those is enumerated. So, for instance, the vision might say, the first angel sounded a trumpet, and then the second angel, and so on. It it counts up the numbers all the way up to seven. But the seven visions at the end of Revelation are different. Each vision is identified by the trigger phrase, and I saw. Just two words in the original Greek, kai idon, but always the same. This is why they're called visions, because John is saying, and I saw. But there are no numbers associated with these visions. There's no ordering. So he doesn't say, first I saw, and second I saw, and so on. He just says, and I saw, and I saw, seven times over. And on the screen, you can see the first line of each of the visions with the trigger phrase, and I saw. And before we come to the details of these visions. What is the significance of them being unnumbered? Well, there's two points to make here. The description of seven visions is using the number seven symbolically to convey the sense that in these visions we have the complete picture of God's final victory. With God's victory, there's not going to be any loose ends at the end of the day. When God's final victory comes, it will be a total and complete victory. But the unnumbered visions also guide us not to create any neat and tidy linear timelines for how all of this is going to play out. The visions are not meant to be read chronologically. They are unnumbered because they each give us a different perspective of what the final victory of God will look like. The very structure of these seven visions doesn't provide us with a neat chronological order, and so we shouldn't impose one on the text. Now, I've had a go at trying to write a series of statements summarising the main facets of God's victory, which these seven visions depict. And I'm certainly not trying to claim that these statements of mine are the best way or the only way to summarise the visions. Uh, But on the screen, you can see I've come up with six statements to summarise the seven visions. Now, in a moment, we're going to look in detail at the very last one. 
the final vision of the seven about the new creation, because that is the great climax of all these visions, and it fills the final two chapters of the book of Revelation. But let me just say a few words about the other statements on the screen. In chapter 19 of Revelation, in the first of the seven visions, Jesus is depicted as a rider on a white horse, and his name is said to be faithful and true. The final victory of God begins with Jesus. The one who was the agent of the first creation will take the lead in accomplishing the new creation. When we think about God's victory, we must remember that it's not just about what happens to individuals. It's also about what happens to the world's systems of power. And there's a fascinating part of one of the visions which relates to this. In chapter 19, verse 19, we get this description. And I think we've got on the next slide, I think we've got this uh, on the screen. It says, And I saw the beast and the kings of the earth and their armies gathered together to wage war against the rider on the horse, that's Jesus, and his army. This is the anticipation of the battle of Armageddon. We obviously use that word kind of to mean some kind of cataclysmic thing that is about to come. Here, the imagery of the vision is evoking the idea of battle as regards God's victory. So verse 19 sets the scene for this great climactic battle between kind of good and evil, and we brace ourselves for a very dramatic description of the battle. And here in New Zealand, when we've had all the um, Lord of the Rings and Hobbit films uh, filmed here, we're really used to seeing on the big screen, and you can see um, an image there that I'd chosen from one of the Hobbit films, we're we're really used to seeing on the big screen these massive, great climactic battles of things. And so we kind of brace ourselves in the book of Revelation for hearing this amazing description of the battle. So after verse 19 comes verse 20, of course, and this is what it says. But the beast was captured, and with it the false prophet who had performed the signs on its behalf. And that, in its entirety, is the description of the battle. That's it. Did you realise that in the book of Revelation... The description of the Battle of Armageddon is that one verse. After all the kind of building up and the anticipation, it's this matter-of-fact description about the defeat of the beast and the false prophet, which, as you've seen in some of the previous uh, messages from this series, are code names for the imperial power of Rome and all the local authorities across the Roman Empire who were loyal to Rome. The book of Revelation is so confident in God's victory that it presents the final battle as a no-contest event. A no-contest event. God's victory over the world's power systems that set themselves up against him is so sure it's not even worth describing the battle. That's a very hopeful truth. And then there is the theme of judgment that we get in these closing visions. And that is part of the completeness of God's victory in the sense that nothing escapes God's gaze. Everything is held accountable. No one and nothing gets to bypass God. But right up to the very end, God's invitation to life is always held out to everyone. So whenever we read of judgment, it must be held alongside God's offer of life. And judgment must also be held alongside the victory of God's people. Because every judgment against what opposes God is a vindication for God's people. That's why these visions show that we will share in the victory of God. A win for God is a win for us. These visions declare that judgment by God 
will be the destruction of all that is evil and everything that refuses to accept God's offer of life. As chapter 20 of the book closes, we are left in no uncertain terms about what has happened. God's just judgments have led to the total destruction of everything that opposes him. And as we move into the visions of chapters 21 and 22, you will see that in those visions there is no more darkness or night. There is only light and splendor. The darkness which symbolizes evil is nowhere to be seen. My scholar friend uh, from the UK, Ian Paul, who has already been quoted in this series, writes this in his commentary on Revelation. John goes on to offer us a vision of a new world, not only where there is no sin or evil, but where even the possibility of evil is eradicated. Judgment does not have the last word since the final vision section in Revelation 21 pulls back the veil on a whole new world. So the end of chapter 20 sets the scene for the last of the seven visions of God's victory. We're going to hear the opening section of chapter 21 and so that you get a different voice, Honor's going to read this for us. Revelation 21, verses 1 to 4. Then I saw a new heaven and a new earth, for the first heaven and first earth had passed away, and there was no longer any sea. I saw the holy city, the new Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven from God, prepared as a bride beautifully dressed for her husband, And I heard a loud voice from the throne saying, Look, God's dwelling is now among the people, and he will dwell with them. They will be his people, and God himself will be with them and be their God. He will wipe every tear from their eyes. There'll be no more death or mourning or crying, or pain, for the old order of things has passed away. Thanks very much. Now, as we get into some of the detail here, please remember this is apocalyptic literature, which, as you've learned across this series, it's highly symbolic in style. It is not meant to be read literally. We are to identify what the imagery evokes as understood by those first readers in the first century Roman Empire. So let's get into a bit of the detail um, here on these verses in the screen. First of all, it talks about this new heaven and earth. So that new heaven and earth will have a continuity and a discontinuity with our current earth and heaven. We know this because of the particular Greek word that John uses for the word new. In New Testament Greek, there are two words for new. The first is neos, which means brand new, with no link with the past. And the other one is kainos, which means more renewed. And The word that John uses here is kainos. This is the same word that the Apostle Paul uses when he talks about us becoming Christians and becoming a new creation. It's a kainos creation. We become renewed as people. And the new creation of the future will be a beautiful renewal of the current one. So it's a kainos new heaven and earth. But I'm sure that some of you, in looking at the next bit, might be a bit disappointed where it talks about there no longer being any sea in the new creation. Uh, Now, Joseph McCauley touched on this a couple of weeks ago, but just for good measure, let me just reiterate 
Uh, don't let this thing about no longer being an EC, don't let this disappoint you, because you guys live next to beautiful ocean, okay? Uh, do not let this verse disappoint you. What we need to understand is that in the ancient world, the sea carried three negative connotations. First, it was a place of danger because you could die at sea and your body would be lost forever. Secondly, because the sea is constantly moving with its swell and its waves, the sea came to symbolize the chaos of unsettled existence. And thirdly, people thought that the sea was the origin of evil. So they postulated the concept of the abyss, which features a number of times in Revelation, starting in chapter 9. The abyss was pictured to be this deep hole at the bottom of the sea, and all the horrible evil things in the world came originally out of this hole at the bottom of the sea. So we need to read this verse about there not being any sea against that first century backdrop. So when it says in the new creation, there's no longer any sea, what it means is that in the new creation, there will be no more evil, no more danger, no more chaos, and no more death. That's good. <laughs> That's good. And next, John sees this glorious city coming down from heaven to earth. Notice the direction of travel. It's important. From heaven to earth. The emphasis of New Testament teaching about end times, uh, which Sam uh, covered last week in particular, is not about Christians being whisked away from the earth to heaven, but about heaven coming to earth. When Christians uh, die before the coming of Jesus, they sleep in death, held in the presence of Jesus, awaiting his return and their resurrection, to be given a new resurrection body like the one that Jesus currently has, a glorified body with material substance, but which never wears out. In the vision of the new creation, Heaven comes down to us, not we go up to heaven. And then the imagery turns into a wedding picture. The city is dressed like a beautiful bride. The Greek word here used for the beautifully dressed is the verb cosmeo. It's where we get our word cosmetics from. The bride is beautiful and adorned in splendor. Now, Revelation and elsewhere in the New Testament uses this wedding metaphor in a double direction. The bride is both the holy city of the new creation and it's the people of God. The church is called the bride of Christ. There are powerful connections here. You know how we use the phrase, oh, it's a marriage made in heaven. You heard that phrase? Well, this is not quite a marriage made in heaven. This is the marriage of heaven and earth and the marriage of Jesus and his people. What does this glorious city represent? Well, John wants us to sit up and take notice uh, because where you can see the word look uh, in the middle of this passage, that's the Greek word idu. It's a attention-grabbing word. Whenever you see that in the New Testament, you're supposed to sit up and take notice. Something important is coming. The text tells us that the holy city is the dwelling of God with his people. And John uses another important word here. It's the word for a tent or a tabernacle. This is what lies behind the phrase, the dwelling place, God's dwelling place of God. This is the same word that is used in the Greek Old Testament for the tent where God used to dwell when his people was wandering in the wilderness. And at the start of John's gospel, where he says, the word became flesh and dwelt among us, literally pitched his tent among us. 
This vision in Revelation has very loaded terminology for the holy city. It's a vision of a perfectly restored relationship between God and his people. And then we have this beautiful promise that in the new creation, there will be no more tears or sadness or pain or death. This links with the rest of New Testament teaching about our future life, that we will have resurrection bodies like the one that Jesus currently has. These bodies will never wear out or get sick or die. Yes, sister, yes. We will not suffer physically because of our bodies. They won't get sick or wear out. And we won't experience relational pain because we'll be in a perfect relationship with God and with one another. That's all good. Now, beyond this section that we have here, we need to note that there is a sobering verse 8, which isn't on the screen here, but it tells us that not everyone will enter the holy city. Revelation does not present us with a doctrine that says everyone will be saved. Sadly, not everyone will respond positively to Jesus' invitation to life. Eternal life can only be experienced in connection with him. So we just need to note that against all this glorious stuff, we just need to note that that's the reality of these closing chapters too. But let's go on now to hear some selected verses from the next section of the vision. And so over to honour again. So Revelation uh, 21 verses 9 to 27 overall with a few missed out. One of the seven angels who had who had the seven bowls full of the la- of the seven last plagues came and said to me, "Come, I will show you the bride, the wife of the lamb." And he carried me away in the spirit to a mountain great and high and showed me the holy city, Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven from God. It shone with the glory of God, and its brilliance was like that of a very precious jewel, like a jasper, clear as crystal. It had a great high wall with 12 gates, and with 12 angels at the gates. On the gates were written the names of the 12 tribes of Israel." The angel who talked with me had a measuring rod of gold to measure the city, its gates and its walls. The city was laid out like a square, as long as it was wide. He measured the city with the rod and found it to be 12,000 stadia in length and as wide and as high as it is long. The angel measured the wall using human measurement and it was 144 cubits thick. The wall was made of jasper and the city of pure gold, as pure as glass. The foundations of the city walls were decorated with every kind of precious stone. The 12 gates were 12 pearls, each gate made of a single pearl. The great street of the city was of gold, as pure as transparent glass. I did not see a temple in the city, because the Lord God Almighty and the Lamb are its temple. The city does not need the sun or the moon to shine on it, for the glory of God gives it light, and the Lamb is its lamp. The nations will walk by its light, and the kings of the earth will bring their splendor into it. On no day will its gates ever be shut, for there will be no night there. The glory and honor of the nations will be brought into it. Nothing impure will ever enter it, nor will anyone who does what is shameful or deceitful, but only those whose names are written in the Lamb's Book of Life. Mm -hmm. 
Thanks very much. The astonishing vision continues. Let's just, uh, as we kind of come into our final closing descent here, uh, let's just dig beneath the powerful imagery again. I'm just going to mention just a few particular features. We're not going to go into the detail of every single thing here, but there's a few things that are very worthy of mention. The first is that we have here a very powerful image of the security that God's people will know in the new creation. In the ancient world, the security of a city lay in its walls. The higher and thicker the walls, the safer the city. In our vision here, the walls of the holy city are 144 cubits wide, thick. And that's 60 meters that's the width of a full rugby pitch. Can I picture that in your head? That's how thick the wall is. And the wall, how high is it? It's 12,000 stadia. What's that in current measurement? It's 2,250 kilometers. Now, just so you can kind of picture, what is that? Um, take the distance north to south of the whole of New Zealand, so bluff to the Cape, and add on to that the distance from here in Napier to the Cape. Put those two together, both of those distances together, that's how high the wall is. And it's as thick as a rugby pitch. This is an impregnable City. You got right, can I imagine that? The, these numbers are also symbolic of, of God and, and his people. But can you just kind of get the scale of this wall? How high it is? It's kind of like, <laughs> that's like a long way up there. No one is going to get over this wall and no one is going to get through this wall. This is God's protection over his people. And then there is powerful symbolism in the dimensions of the city. Now, there isn't time to cover all the, diff the details of the numbers here, but one of the most important features is that the holy city is shaped like a gigantic cube. It's as high as it's long and wide. Now, cube shapes and cube numbers, a cube number is what you get when you multiply something by itself twice. So, a thousand is a cube number because that's ten times ten times ten. 10. So cubic numbers and cubic shapes are symbolic of God and by association us as his people. Why does that come about? Well, it comes about actually from the Old Testament. Because when King Solomon built his famous temple for God in Jerusalem, in the very middle of the temple building was the small room where the manifest presence of God was said to dwell, called the Holy of Holies. That room was an exact cube in shape because the ancient people of God believed that God was a God of order. He brings order from chaos, as he does in the very beginning of the book of Genesis with, with creation. And a cube is a most ordered shape because all the lengths of the sides are exactly the same. So cubes and cubic numbers came to be symbolic of God. And a second feature of the dimensions of the city is that it is ginormously big. As I mentioned, it's 2,250 kilometers in all directions. So if the center of the city was on the island of Patmos, where John is, it would extend all the way to Rome in the west and Jerusalem in the east. And it would be big enough to accommodate the entire population of the Roman Empire of the first century with room to spare. So, yes, the numbers here are, are symbolic and are not meant to be literal, but this is a vision of space, of room 
There is room in God's new creation for everyone who chooses to receive his offer of life. No one needs to worry that there's not going to be room for you. As we said in our communion prayer, there's room at the table. There is room at the table of God's wedding feast, which our communion is a foretaste of. And we cannot escape the sheer splendor of all these things in this final vision. The building materials of the city are all precious stones. Even the foundations, which you can't see, (laughs) are precious stones, let alone all the things you can see. When we finally get to the new creation, I'm not sure we're going to have the vocabulary to describe its splendor. Revelation, what a book. What a book and what great visions of the final victory of God. Are you feeling hopeful? (laughs) Remember, John has not employed the word hope at all in his entire book. But these seven final visions cannot but leave us feeling a powerful sense of hope about the future, which transforms our present And that is the most important thing about how we apply the hope that we find in the book of Revelation. It's not all about the future. It's about the future impacting our present, which is why in chapter 22, we hear these words. And there's a slide, I think, for this. Uh, It says, then he told me, do not seal up the words of the prophecy of this scroll because the time is near. Now, the Old Testament prophet Daniel was told to seal up the words of some of his prophecies because they would not be fulfilled for hundreds of years. But John is told to do the opposite. Do not seal up the words. Why? Because all the words are relevant for God's people right now. Revelation lifts the lid on both current and future reality in order to inspire our living in challenging times. That's why the book ends with a prayer. Amen, come Lord Jesus. It's the prayer designed to answer every prayer of deep longing we have ever uttered. Because when Jesus comes again, the final victory of God will be complete and all our deepest longings will be satisfied. These seven visions of the great victory of God are set before us to hold us steady in the challenging storms of the current time. As I said towards the beginning of this message, all of us need the assurance that our present experience of challenge and suffering is not the final say on our lives. It is the visions of revelation that give us that confidence. We can live with patient endurance now because we know that God's ultimate purposes will be fulfilled. In this present time, we can find ourselves in a battle for truth. It's a battle fought with words. As you've seen in this series, Revelation depicts Jesus in a vision with him having a sword coming out of his mouth. That's symbolic that Jesus' words of truth are speaking into this battle. And one of the ways we live with hope is by joining our words with those of Jesus. Because those who bear hope must bestow hope. I wonder if you've ever had the experience of chatting with an unchurched person. And like, let's imagine like on Monday morning, you're in the workspace And a colleague kind of says to you, oh, I was looking at the news over the weekend. Oh, like the world news. It is also terrible. I don't know what the world is coming to. Ever heard somebody use that phrase? I don't know what the world's coming to. Can I suggest the next time somebody says that to you, you do the following. So they say to you, I don't know what the world's coming to. Say to them, I do. I know what the world's coming to. Would you like to know why I think that? Because the reality is, we do know what the world is coming to because of all this stuff we've been learning from the book of Revelation. 
when other people lose hope because of the state of the world, we can speak hope into their lives, that there is a God who will one day judge evil for what it is and finally destroy it. And not only that, but we get to partner with God in projects of restoration even before Jesus returns. That's why we're still here now. We who bear hope also bestow hope. Revelation ends with this astonishing vision of the holy city. The promised new creation is described as a royal residence, the dwelling of the true king. When I lived in the UK, I had the privilege of staying on two occasions within the walls of a royal residence. I was the conference manager for two conferences which took place within the walls of Windsor Castle. And uh, there's a wonderful picture of some of Windsor Castle. Now, of course, because the castle uh, is a royal residence, security is very high. And because I was going to be staying within the castle grounds, there's a lovely guest house inside called St. George's House, uh, I had to submit my passport and all my car details ahead of time. So I sent that all off and I hoped that everything would be all right. And then on the day that I drove to Windsor to set up for the conference, I was driving up to the gate and I realised I was going to have to speak to the security guards and I was hoping that all the details that I checked um, had had sent would be checked out. And I was a little bit nervous driving up to the gate because this was a time when the Queen Mother was still alive and she was resident in the castle at the time. So I knew that security was going to be even higher and there were two kind of checkpoints either side of the gate and I knew full well that the guards on either side of the gate just tucked out of sight would have had live you know, rifles or whatever they, you know, whatever they use, they would all be licensed to kill kind of security guards. So I'm kind of driving up to the castle going, oh, this is going to be all right. And as I got near to the gate, the gate just opened. And I kept kind of driving and kept driving and the gate was open and I kept driving and I got level with the two security guards, and they started waving at me. So I kind of waved at them, and I kind of drove straight through and ended up just parking in the special parking area. And I kind of stopped the car and turned off the engine and kind of thought for a moment, well, that wasn't very good security, was it? I kind of like, I thought, you know, here I am, isn't the British security service like the best in the world and all this kind of stuff? And like, I've just driven into a royal residence and the Queen Mother's here and nobody's stopped me. I'm just like, they've just like waved at me. And it's like, that's not very good at all. And then I realised something. I realised that I had thought that I'd driven in and these guards had waved at me not knowing who I was. The reality was... They knew everything about me. My passport details had been run through numerous police things and security stuff. My car details had been checked out and they knew it had never been stolen or used for crime and all this kind of stuff. I had been checked out at the highest level. They didn't need to know anything more about me. They knew I had got clearance from the highest level that's why all they needed to do was wave at me. <laughs> and probably as I drove up, there was probably a, like a scanner, facial scanner thing that was checking out against my passport and all that kind of business. They knew all about me. It's going to be like that for all God's people when we stand at the gates of the new creation the royal residence of God. Some of us might be quite nervous about whether we're going to be allowed in. But if we've placed our trust in Jesus, then the work of the cross has already been effected in our lives. We have a, already a new status with God. We are right with him. We have security clearance, as it were, from the highest authority to come into the new creation. So on that great and glorious day, when we stand before those pearly gates with a new resurrection body, 
We don't have to fear that the gate's going to be shut in our faces. Like those Windsor Castle guards did to me, the angels at the pearly gates are just going to wave. <laughs> They're going to wave us in, no questions asked. Because salvation is a done deal for us once we submit our lives to the Lordship of Jesus. At the start of this talk, I showed you a quote by C.S. Lewis that answered the question, how do you offer a message that conveys hope in the most compelling way? And Lewis's answer was, by writing with words that leave the reader reaching for the word hope without you having to use it explicitly. Let me finish now with a final quote from Lewis again, which shows how he chose to follow his own guidance about writing as he wrote the closing paragraph in his book, The Last Battle, which is the final seventh book of the Chronicles of Narnia. So this is how Lewis uses his words to evoke hope in us for the glorious future God has in store. And as he spoke, Aslan, who is the lion who symbolically represents Jesus in the Narnia stories, Aslan no longer looked to them like a lion. But the things that began to happen after that were so great and beautiful that I cannot write them. And for us, this is the end of all the stories. And we can most truly say that they all lived happily ever after. But for them, it was only the beginning of the real story. And their life in this world and all their adventures in Narnia had only been the cover and the title page. Now at last they were beginning chapter one of the great story which no one on earth has read, which goes on forever, in which every chapter is better than the one before. I'm going to close with a prayer. Uh, this is a prayer that is drawn from uh, the Anglican uh, Daily Prayer Liturgy. It's a prayer based on Psalm 110, which is a messianic psalm, which celebrates the victory of God's anointed king. The themes of this prayer resonate perfectly with the hope we receive through these final visions of Revelation. So let's pray. Lord Jesus, divine Son and eternal priest, inspire us with the confidence of your final conquest of evil and grant that daily on our way we may drink of the brook of your eternal life and so find courage against all adversities for your mercy's sake. And all God's people said, Amen. Amen.